Ladies and gentlemen, I think we'll begin, first of all, with a very warm welcome to Vernon Square. Oh, now I'm in front of the mic. A very warm welcome to Vernon Square. For many of you, this may be the first visit. And you know that even when you see it gleaming from afar in the night, it's still quite attractive to get in and get into our wonderful Lecture Room 1. This is a very special occasion, marking a very special collaboration and exhibition. We're celebrating 60 years of the life of Roman Vishnia and, of course, his legacy, uh, with two very special exhibitions that are at the Jewish Museum in London and the Photographer's Gallery in London, because the <coughs> splendid exhibition which Maya Benton curated in New York was too big and too splendid to be cut into one, just one venue. Uh, and I must say to you immediately that both these exhibitions finish on February the 24th, so you've got plenty of time to see them or to catch up on your second venue. I've seen the Photographer's Gallery and I'm looking forward very much to catching up uh, with the Jewish Museum later on. Now this is a special Courtauld occasion too because Maya uh, Benton was trained at the Courtauld amongst all your other universities, Maya, and the director of the Photographer's Gallery, Brett Rogers, is also one of our alumna. So there's a special Courtauld element to this too. And of course, you can't have anything without in-house people, and it's an opportunity for me to thank the in-house curator at the Jewish Museum, Morgan Wadsworth Boyle, uh, the curator at the Photographer's Gallery, Anna Danneman. Uh, and when it says on your program that I've organized this from the court order, and that is really not very true. I've, I've been an active and enthusiastic participant in uh, the first lot of discussions with an old colleague from other times, Natasha Plowright, who's now at the Photographer's Gallery. And uh, then I've enthusiastically endorsed, but just really handed over all the organization to uh, Jessica Ataman uh, at the, um, of our research forum, Ackerman, and um, all the wonderful event stewards who will be whisking you away at the end of this very long Vishniak evening to refreshing drinks in our research forum, which is on another floor, but it will be very easy for you to get up there. So thanks in advance also to our event stewards. Um, now, um, now, one or two things to say uh, at the beginning, just to pace yourselves. Um, Maya is going to speak for 40 minutes and then hand over for two very focused 15 minute discussions to her um, uh, collaborators I'm going to introduce in a second. Then there's going to be a short um, um, talk, very, very, uh, sorry, not bef before I, when I end and before they begin. <coughs> There's going to be a very short talk by the Death Penalty Project people, uh, by Annette So, who've actually helped fund this. And you, as you can imagine, with participants, very distinguished participants from America and from uh, Amsterdam, this has been uh, quite an operation. We've had quite a lot of discussion. So without more ado, I'd like to introduce Maya Benton more formally. Um, <clears throat> she's a curator at the International Center of Photography in New York. And there's a wonderful video of her on the Jewish Museum website uh, actually explaining how absolutely huge the Roman Vishniak archive is that she has managed to uh, organize. And as she says, these exhibitions are not a kind of retrospective uh, for all time, but the beginning of many more projects that will circulate internationally, we are, we are sure. Um, she's obviously an expert not only on photography, but Jewish material and visual culture. She went to Brown University and Harvard, as well as the Courtauld. And she's uh, organizing a traveling exhibition of the photographer Gillian Laub's contemporary images of segregated proms and racially motivated violence in America South, in the American South. And her next book is going to be an anthology of seminal, seminal texts on Jews and photography, um, which I think we all need very much. I'd also like to say that my dear former colleague Shunamit Bear is in the audience, and the work she's supervised over so many years in this particular area, and to do especially with Jewish and great photographers in London, is something that we're all supremely grateful for and intersects so much with your interests. 
So the second speaker, Hans Rosenblum, um, is one of the two curators of photography at the Rijksmuseum and has co-curated many shows including Modern Times, Photography in the 20th Century, 2014, New Realities, Photography in the 19th Century, 2017, with uh, great big books to go with them, co-authored with Matt <coughs> He's written on Man Ray, Electricity, 10 advertising photographs by Man Ray. Before my Man Ray repertoire, I can't quite think which these ones are, so this is tantalizing. A big book on Daguerre, What's Wrong with Daguerre? I don't think I could answer that either. And um, the first 50 years of Dutch professional photography, I can't answer that either. But we know that this is going to be passionately interesting and we're going to go more often to see your shows in the Rijksmuseum. And now you're going to do a thematically organised history of photography. So that's quite challenging too. And then Laura Wexler, we're so pleased to have you here, Laura, tonight. Professor of American Studies, <coughs> Professor of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies and co-chair of the Women's Faculty Forum at Yale. The author of Tender Violence, Domestic Visions in an Age of U.S. Imperialism, 2000, Pregnant Pictures, Routledge, 2000, and um, co that was co-authored with Sandra Matthews. Tender Violence got a great big award, the Joan Kelly, Kelly Memorial Prize of the American Historical Association for the best book in women's history and or feminist theory. And um, she co-authored with Laura Frost, Amy Hunkford, and John McKay, the volume Interpretation and the Holocaust as a special issue of Yale Journal of Criticism. Uh, and in 1999, she founded the Photography Memory Workshop at Yale. So all these different interests are going to weave together tonight. And as I said, before we start with Maya's speech, I'd just like to ask um, Annette So, Annette, I haven't met you yet, who's going to come and say something about the Death Penalty Project. And thank you so much for helping to bring these people to us tonight. Hi, good evening everybody. Um, as Sarah has mentioned, my name is Inexo. I work at the Death Penalty Project and we are a legal action charity based in London and we represent prisoners facing the death penalty worldwide um, with a special focus on Commonwealth countries, in particular former British colonies. Um, we have been working with the Deaf, um, I mean, with the Photographers Gallery for the last few years, um, coordinating and sponsoring public events in conjunction with human rights and raising awareness of human rights issues and more generally, unfortunately, human wrongs. Um, we are very delighted to be sponsoring um, the series of events and public programs this year in conjunction with the Roman Fishnet exhibition and having met Maya and spoken to her and seen the exhibition, I'm sure um, we're in for a treat this evening. So very excited and very much looking forward to it. And thank you very much for coming. especially on a Valentine's Day. I've, um, I've added a Valentine's Day surprise to my lecture <laughs> because I thought for everyone to come out and uh, give up romance to hear about photographs of Jewish life in Eastern Europe in the interwar period, we should add something sexy to the lecture today. So um, what I'm going to show you uh, at the end of this lecture are never-before-seen photographs that Roman Vishniak took of his second wife and um, formerly pre-war mistress Edith Ernst. No one has ever seen those photographs before, and I'm only able to show them to you today because Mara Vishniak Cohn, who is Roman Vishniak's daughter, um, she passed away two months ago and asked me not to show the photos until she died. And so now she has given me permission to show these photographs, and I thought it was a really um, interesting romance and photographic relationship, and so I can show those images for the first time, and I thought for Valentine's Day it might be a good way to start. So, thank you all for coming. And before I 
start talking about Roman Vishniak, I have so many people to thank, and most deeply, uh, Shulamit Baer, who's in this audience, who was my advisor when I was at the Courtauld, and guided so much of the early research that went into this exhibition. So this is very much a homecoming to bring this exhibition to London, and to be able to acknowledge her. Um, without her input and guidance in its earliest stages, this exhibition would not exist. So Shulamit, I don't know where you're sitting, but thank you very much. Ah, uh, she is. And it's, it's um, really meaningful to bring this back to the Courtauld and have this conversation with all of you and to bring the work back to London. I also want to thank the Safra Foundation that supported my time at the Courtauld and Sarah and our colleagues at the Jewish Museum and the Photographer's Gallery. One could not ask for better partners. Anna and Morgan were just dream curator, friend, colleague, partners in this endeavor and they made this work their own. To take an exhibition that you work on for so long and divide it between two institutions is challenging. It's like handing your baby over to somebody. And I couldn't have found better stewards and caretakers of Vishniak and his legacy. I hope you'll all have time to see both exhibitions. They did such a tremendous job. Uh, and I have, have such a great appreciation for the care that they lavished on Vishniak and telling his life story and bringing it to London. I also want to thank Joseph Kendra from the Photographer's Gallery for doing so much to organize and put together this event, and of course to Laura and Hans for joining and talking about the Shniak. So with that, I'm going to start. I want to warn you that I have to, um, in 40 minutes, give an overview of one, of one of the, I think, great photographers of the 20th century. So I have a lot of images to show you and get through. And what I really want to do is suggest a reappraisal of what has previously been known about Roman Vishniak. Roman Vishniak took the most widely recognized and most widely reproduced photographic record of Jewish life in Eastern Europe before the Holocaust. And he's known primarily for these four years of work. But his career spanned early engagements with modernism in Weimar Berlin to his pioneering color microscopy of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And I'll be showing you a survey of all of that work so that we can step back and see not only iconic work, the iconic work for which he is known, but also start to um, understand that here is one of, really one of the great and most versatile and accomplished photographers of the 20th century. I also want to recontextualize that iconic work um, from the late 1930s and to this broader context of commissioned social documentary photography. And finally, argue for Vishniak's position as a great modernist. Uh, one, of the, one of the reasons that Vishniak was only known for four years of work was because only 250 of his images <coughs> had been published during his lifetime. For the first time when I started to organize this exhibition, because of the generosity of Mara Vishniak Cohn, his daughter, who was a tremendous steward of his legacy, she donated the entire archive and made it publicly available. And so we set about digitizing all 10,000 negatives, 10,000 prints, 30,000 pages of personal correspondence and ephemera, including the color science slides. All of that is now publicly available online in a shared digital database between the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC, UC Berkeley, where the physical objects are now housed, and the International Center of Photography, which manages the database. So this was really a pioneering partnership between America's great Holocaust History Museum, the country's premier photography museum, and UC Berkeley, one of the great public institutions in America. And so I think with this shared research and archive, we're opening up this archive. And as Sarah had said, this is not the final word on Vishniak. I think that there are probably 20 dissertations sitting in this archive. And so the goal of this exhibition and the book is to open it up for further research. And we already have a few of those initiatives starting, people starting to work on dissertations and targeted exhibitions. Uh, and I hope that through this exhibition's travel, it will encourage another generation to look afresh at the wealth of material, most of it unexplored in Vishniak's archive. So with that, I'm going to just give you an overview of Vishniak's early years. This is Roman Vishniak. Um, at age five, uh, Vishniak was born in 1897 in Pavlovsk in his family's dacha or summer home outside of St. Petersburg. And he was raised in Moscow, where he was steeped in Soviet camera culture, which was largely Jewish camera culture. Um, most of the photographic studios in Petersburg and Moscow were, were owned by Jews. And on his seventh birthday, he was given a camera and he was given a microscope. And he attached the camera to the microscope's lens and he magnified a cockroach, a cockroach's leg, three times. And that was his first photograph. 
He was a student of biology and zoology, and from the very beginning of his earliest forays into <coughs> photography, his interest in zoology and biology and scientific research and inquiry, and his passion for photography were inextricably linked. And so that's a thread that you'll hear throughout his work. He became a graduate student in zoology at Chanyavsky University in Moscow. His parents left during the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, and they moved, they settled to Berlin, but he stayed to study and did pioneering work on the axolotl, which is a salamander, a uh, form of a salamander, so in case you're wondering what that looks like. Um, but by 1920, he felt that he needed to leave Russia and join his family in Berlin. And on the way to Berlin, he married Luta Bach. She was a Latvian Jewish woman from Riga and they got married at a Latvian border town. And he took, um, he took these photographs of her on their honeymoon in this border town with hand-cut Russian film in 1920. And we developed them, we made platinum prints of them for the first time for the exhibition, they're in the cases. And what you see is that he was already an incredibly accomplished amateur photographer before he ever arrived in Berlin. He and Luta settled in the thrumming metropolis of Berlin and Vishniak started to navigate his adopted new city uh, with his camera. So here, this photograph was taken in the egress of their home on Pariser Strat in, uh, Williams, in Wilmersdorf in Charlottenburg, which is where a lot of middle class and upper middle class uh, Russian expatriates and Russian Jews settled in Berlin in the early 1920s. And so he stood in doorways and often watched city life go by and took photographs with his camera. And his passion for street photography at this time was more of an amateur pursuit. But you can see that he was influenced by avant-garde and modernist movements. He was experimenting with framing, with camera angles. This looks like a fixed line film, film still. And this is not work that one would associate with a photographer whose iconic images were of Orthodox Jewish men in yeshivas in Eastern Europe. He was, in fact, a great modernist. And you see in the unpublished work and in the unpublished negatives the influence of this Weimar aesthetic training on the later work. He and Luta lived a comfortable life. His family was involved in um, banking and other businesses, and they wanted Roman to go into those businesses, and he failed at all of them. He kept trying to just pursue his scientific research and his photography, and finally they allowed him to do that. And he and Luta, um, built a terrarium in their house. He had a uh, photo processing lab in his bathtub. These are his children, um, Mara and Wolf. So, let's see if I can. Um, this is Wolf, his son. He was born in 1922, and Mara was born in 1926. This is his wife, Luta. And in roughly 1930, he went to the Photo Automat, which was one of the earliest uh, photo booths in the Vericom department store, which is here. And he took this small Photo Automat image of himself with his four-year-old daughter. It's in the exhibition, and I think even though it's only this small, it's such a tremendous object, uh, both because it shows his passion for early inventions in photography, and also his, his relationship with his daughter. <coughs> and it is because of her that we have access to all of these materials. Um, Vishniak, because his family was financially comfortable, always had access to the newest technologies, the greatest cameras. So he got the Rala camera, which creates square frames, which I'll show you the year it was introduced to the market. He got the latest generation of Leicas when they were introduced to the market. And so he used these two formats, um, which you'll see is a rectangle and a square intermittently and um, always with the latest cameras. And it's also through looking at his work in Weimar Berlin, a kind of history of, of photography. Um, this is another example of him positioning himself in a doorway where he watches the uh, Berlin street life go by and he's experimenting with different approaches to cropping and to framing. Um, this is a woman window washer in Vienna. And again, this is a very small example of a huge body of work in the archive that had never before been printed or published. This is, um, in Vienna, you see the um, horseshoe and the chimney sweep. These are symbols of good luck, and it's in a casino. He was also experimenting with night photography. This is the famous Rieserad, the, um in, in Vienna. And as he was training his eye, 
his love of animals and of zoology and biology were always inextricably linked to his passion for photography. You can see his reflection in the eye of the horse holding up the Leica camera. And he was also a passionate photographer of his own family. Here is Mara with her skating instructor, who she says she had a huge crush on. <laughs> and Mara and Wolf. And then this is them celebrating Purim, a holiday where you dress up in costume in their apartment, in their grand apartment in Berlin. And he was pursuing his research in photomicroscopy using magnification um, to, document the, um, to document biological phenomena. And as he was doing that, he became very close to the zookeeper in Berlin. One of the things that um, upper middle class German Jews would do is have zoo memberships, the famous Berlin Zoo, and they would go there on the weekends. It was a kind of leisure time activity. But um, shortly after the rise of the Nazis, uh, Jews were kicked out of the zoo. And so he took this photograph um, shortly after Jews were prohibited from going to the zoo. And you can see that it looks like the people are in cages and the polar bears are looking at them. And this signal, signals a kind of um, painful shift in his photography. In 1933, with the Nazi rise to power, Vishniak took to the streets with his camera and documented the ominous changes that he saw on the streets. By this point, it was illegal and very dangerous for Jews to take photographs on the street. And so he would use his daughter Mara as a prop so that if he was stopped by a Nazi, he would say, no, no, I'm not taking pictures of banners or swastikas or signs. I was, I'm just taking a picture of my daughter. And in this way, he was able to document the changes that were taking place. This is a Nazi phrenology shop uh, advertising the superiority of the Aryan skull. And he documented <coughs> stormtroopers from a distance, as you can see. But by 1935 and 1936, and we were able to date this photograph because of the, um, the movie poster. What you see is a swastika flag right here. It became the quotidian backdrop of everyday life. So in 1933, he took to the streets to document these changes. But by 1935 and 1936, here you can see it again, these symbols of Nazi oppression became the backdrop of his photographs in street photography. This looks like an innocuous photograph of children playing with his wonderful shadow lines, but there are eight <coughs> swastika flags lining the streets. And again here, you see the swastika with the Berlin Olympic sign, and it's also on his lapel. We have hundreds of these images in the archive, and I urge all of you to explore it and, and mine this further. Vishniak's family was subject to the same restrictive measures that he was documenting with his camera. And this is the Judicial Culture Bund membership card. When Jews were increasingly kicked out of participating in social activities, theater, museums, film, the zoo, uh, they created their own ancillary Jewish cultural institutions, and Vishniak and his family were part of that shift. And you can see that they were paying their membership dues every time and had their stamp. One of the great uh, discoveries and treasures in this exhibition is this really humble piece of paper that we found on the back of a not-so-great photograph of a stork in flight. Um, why is it so interesting? Because what it shows is a Jewish star, Megan David, with a camera in the center. Uh, Weimar Berlin was full of amateur camera clubs and professional camera clubs, and Vishniak was an avid member of those clubs. Uh, but with the advent of the Nazis, they were kicked out, they were excluded. And so they created their own kind of Jewish camera clubs. This was a Frankfurt Jewish camera club where they exhibited Vishniak's photograph of a stork. This is the only um, remnant of that club. I talked to the Jewish Museum in Frankfurt, and they had no evidence of this existing. And it shows you. Um, the very precarious space that the Jewish community was occupying in 1937 and 1938 in Berlin. This is the only example that we have of these Jewish photographers who had been really avid members of these camera clubs in Weimar Berlin and had shifted to creating their own communities as they were trying to escape. Vishniak's reputation as an accomplished amateur street photographer uh, fell on the radar of Jewish social service organizations and Jewish philanthropists who were increasingly recognizing how important photography was to publicizing the uh, needs of the communities and to raise money for brochures and newsletters and slide lectures, mostly in America, to raise money for these communities who were in peril. And he started to document Jewish social service organizations and Jewish community organizations in Berlin. Here is a middle class soup kitchen. Here you can see Vishniak with his Leica held up to his eye, the shadow. Um, here are boys wrestling outside of the Jewish soup kitchens. This is a Jewish school. 
After the schools had been Aryanized, the Jewish children, including Vishniak's own, were kicked out. Here's a children's book from the time that actually shows them Jewish children who look kind of simian in their appearance being kicked out so these nice Aryan children can enjoy their school. And Mara, Vishniak's daughter, remembers being inundated with these anti-Semitic images that were targeted to children. This was actually the number one Christmas gift this year. Um, so as Vishniak's family was suffering the very, um, the, the very trend that he was documenting with his camera, he was also looking at young Jewish uh, efforts to retrain so that they could make Aliyah and move to Palestine and build new lives as farmers, um, as construction workers, learning um, farming techniques. So here you see a Jewish agrarian training camp called Gutfinkel, which was supported by Salman Shakin, the department store magnet, and a soup kitchen. And he was also bringing his Weimar avant-garde aesthetic to this uh, work that documented Jewish kids learning how to farm so they could build new lives if they were lucky enough to get visas to get out. This is one of my favorite photographs because it shows a boy learning how to milk a cow. Those are fake udders. These were urban Jewish kids in Berlin. They wouldn't know how to milk a cow like I wouldn't know how to milk a cow. And they were, as they were desperately trying to get visas to get out um, and find safety, they were retraining, learning Hebrew, learning um, different skills. And Vishniak documented that in Germany. That work must have fallen on the radar of the JDC, which was the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, which was and still is the world's largest Jewish relief organization. In 1935, Salman Shakin, who I mentioned before, who had funded this Gutfinkel camp in Berlin, was also one of the board members of the JDC. In 1935, Roman Vishniak was hired, and he was sent east for the first of what was four years of assignments. He was told to photograph the poorest, most destitute, most kind of you know, authentic Ostudent, or Eastern Jews, so that those images could be used to raise money for the plight of the interwar, dislocated Eastern Jew. Vishniak is often thought of as a ghetto photographer. He was not in the ghettos or photographing the Holocaust. He left before the Holocaust took place. He was documenting Jewish life. After World War I, there were two million destitute, dislocated Eastern Jews, and many of them were suffering the crippling effects of anti-Semitic boycotts in Poland. Vishniak was hired by the JDC to go and take photographs of these communities in need so that those images could be used on um, annual campaigns, letterheads, uh, slide lectures, so that philanthropists would write checks and help support these um, communities. And that's, what, that's the original purpose of his photographs. He later obfuscated the context of that commission. So after he, he became very well known, and Laura will talk a bit about the reception of his work in America, um, after he became well known, there was a mythology that started to uh, be created by him about this kind of self-imposed assignment. He was asked on NBC radio, were you sent on assignment? And he said, no, I was sent by God, and that assignment I followed. So one of the goals of bringing forward this uh, larger body of work is to reposition his iconic work in the context of commissioned social documentary photography. If I said to you, let's raise money for homeless shelters in London, and we would get a famous photographer, and we would go and we would take poignant moving photographs of children and families in homeless shelters, and then there was a kind of natural disaster. London fell into this ocean, and 50 years from now, people said, oh, this is what everyone in London looked like. That's what we have done the most iconic images of that world that represent a kind of collective memory and collective place of origin for millions of Jews was actually the product of a documentary assignment to depict poverty. And so what I'm trying to do is show this broader, um, much more versatile body of work that shows secular and middle class life and it also shows an influence of the avant-garde on his work. These are the images for which he was known. But the unpublished work it was 10,000 negatives in bags like this. So no dates, no captions, no numbering system. And uh, 1960s America and 1920s Berlin and 1930s Eastern Europe was all kind of mixed together. We've now put them all online and we've started to do the work of dating and identifying them, but much more work remains to be done. And this is the generation in which the survivors of the Holocaust are rapidly dying out and we will not have living, living testimony, living memory in a few years. I would urge all of you, if you have um, parents, grandparents who are survivors, to go online with your relatives and help us identify these photographs because time is running out. And the way that memory is constructed, which has been 
largely through testimony, will shift. And I think photographs will bear a much larger burden in representing this vanished world. And now we have 10,000 negatives, but they're all, as you can see, individual and untitled. And we're hoping through the traveling of this exhibition and having everything online that we can get people to come and help us mine this archive. This is what it looks like now. It's very organized. <coughs> And in these boxes, we started to find treasures of unpublished work that argues that he wasn't just a great Jewish photographer, a photographer of shtetl life, but actually one of the great modernist photographers of the 20th century. This looks like a Cartier-Bresson that kind of um, recalls the decisive moment. Look at these two wonderful and possibly pointed roofs and then the shadow line with the stripes on this sheet the girl holding her head up, there's someone holding her arm up to her head. And this is this perfect photograph, and it was never published, only one print exists. Again, this is one of my favorite photographs. You see a boy, this is in a poor basement dwelling, but this wonderful vertical register of kindling wood and a little corner of a Yiddish newspaper mirroring a little corner of lace. And it does depict poverty. Um, this was taken in Krofmalna Street in Warsaw, where I.B. Singer lived, and which became one of the main arteries of the Warsaw Ghetto, and it was a network of 32 um, families living in a basement dwelling. So this was part of the commission to depict poverty. And yet it also um, reflects the avant-garde aesthetic that um, he embraced when he was living in Weimar Berlin. More of the unpublished images show the egress to this basement dwelling. And here you see um, a stack of wood with nails in it that uses kindling wood. I think of all the childproofing I've done. <laughs> I think of this kid sleeping with this tower of wood and this little piece of wallpaper that's been stenciled over. The details are incredible, and the framing and the composition are so modern. And this is the work that was never published. And in his and this is one of his most iconic images. It's a grandmother and her grandchildren in this basement dwelling. In his published images, it's important to understand the context of the JDC Commission in framing this work. Because at the same time, the Vishniak was sent east by the JDC, the world's largest Jewish relief organization. Um, Dorothy Lang was sent west, and the Farm Security Administration sent, sent American photographers to document the crippling effects of the Depression and the Dust Bowl, and Vishniak's work should be seen in that context. So here you have Walker Evans, sharecropper's family, same years, Vishniak's family in the basement dwellings. Selma, Alabama, African American store by Walker Evans. And here you have a Jewish owned shop in Bratislava. All of the photographs that I'm showing you were taken at the same time that Vishniak took his photographs, the same years that he was documenting poverty and destitution in Eastern Europe. These photographers were photographing in the American South and West, depicting poverty for the same purposes to generate relief and changes in policy. Vishniak focused on children. He focused on the poorest and the most destitute because that's what would pull on heartstrings. And there is a precedent to that, which is, among others, Jacob Rees, who photographed kids living in squalor in the tenements in New York. Among his most famous photographs is a girl named Sarah. And the story that goes with this image is that she lived in a basement dwelling and she didn't have shoes because only those who worked could afford shoes. And so she had to spend the winter in bed and her father painted this flower stencil above her head, and he called it the only flower of her youth. This was printed on Sadako or charity tins at the time that he took the photograph. And remarkably, it was used as the letterhead for the annual campaign for the JBC. She became the literal face of the campaign, and this is one of the rare examples where we can see how the photograph was used and deployed at the time that the photograph was taken. This is a boy with a toothache. And not only did he photograph and uh, focus his photographs on poor children, but also this narrative of um, people suffering the effects of these very real and very crippling boycotts in Poland. And so here, this is what I call the shopkeeper with nothing to sell. There were these shopkeepers, they were religious Jewish men. Um, he focused his lens mostly on Jewish men because they were marked as Jews by their difference in dress. Gentile women and Jewish women tended to look the same. And so, the photographs that we have tend to focus on the lives and experiences of men, and this broader archive of 10,000 negatives now shows, of course, women and their stories. So in this unpublished image, you see a woman shopkeeper. You see this wonderful diagonal bisection of 
the shelves, and her shelves really overflowing with goods, and she's looking directly at the photographer, this kind of Neue Frau Bob. So this is the work that was published, and this is the work that was unpublished, that I think argues that he was even a, a, an even greater photographer. And also that the secular and middle class life had been removed from the published record. Vishnak's images, his most iconic images, focus on Orthodox Jewish men. And these are the images that have been carried down. The reason that I became so involved with Vishniak and so interested in his work has to do with this one photograph, which is a pretty pedestrian photograph that's not going to excite that many people. But in my family, this is the greatest photograph that was ever taken. Because my family is from a town called Novogrudek. And when this book came out, I was in t t 11th grade. And I remember relatives in Buenos Aires, in Los Angeles, in Tel Aviv, screaming with excitement on the phone about this book because of the photograph that included the name of the town. It's not even a photo of the town. It's a signpost with like, the name of the town on it. But that was enough to, um, to make a, a, a very poignant connection to a life that was kind of wrested away from members of my family who'd gone through the war. And what we had were only a few family photographs. This is actually my grandmother. Here she is in the middle. This is the town ambulance with the town beauty on the hood. This is my grandmother on the back of the motorcycle. And here are my great grandmother and her sister. These are the family photographs that many people have from Eastern and Central Europe. And yet this is the published record that's become an icon that represents that world. And so I think, again, this is a Vishniak photograph that was never published. In looking at this broader archive, it's important to think about the women's stories that were never told and that were cut out of the published record, and also more secular middle class life, a wide range of Jewish life. This is one of my, I think, favorite photographs because you see what Vishniak was doing here. Here are this woman and this man at, at a kind of bar, and he is in focus and she is out of focus. And if it had been published, this is what we would have seen. And this tells you the story of how women's lives and secular life were kind of extricated from the published record. And then you start to see the photos in the archive quite differently. This was one of the great discoveries. Here's a woman wearing a skirt to just below her knee, her blouse is unbuttoned, her sleeves are rolled up. And then when we saw the back, it reads Satul Mare, which is the seat of the Satmar Hasidim, the most ultra-Orthodox sect of Judaism. She was walking around um, the Satmar section of, of Mea Sharim in Israel or New York, dressed like that, they would be throwing things at her. And yet here she is in the center of town. And the unpublished work shows you that, that the ultra-Orthodox, um, people think of that as a kind of authentic view of Jewish life in Eastern Europe, but it's actually one interpretation of that world. And in showing the broader archive of Vishniak's work, I think it also argues for a re-education about what that world looked like. Here is his iconic image of beggars. Um, the story that he attached to this is that they were um, soldiers in World War I, and they lost their families, and now they are begging. But they become porters, and so the only way they can survive is to take um, to take change to carry things and drag things. Jews in Poland were in the 30s excluded from practicing most professions. And so one of the few jobs that was uh, available to them was being a schlepper, <coughs> being a porter. But in the unpublished image, you see these two Jewish porters. Yes, they're poor, their clothes are in tatters, but they're these strong bodied porters in this incredible composition. So this is what was known, <coughs> and this is the unknown story. And you see that the unknown story, here are two more porters, argue that he was really one of the great 20th century photographers. And this looks like an August Zander portrait. And this was actually included, Vince Letty, who's the uh, photo critic for the New Yorker, included this in his exhibition, This Is Not a Fashion Photograph. So Vishniak's work is now having this larger life as, as a great photographer beyond this kind of Jewish world in which he had been previously known. And in the unpublished work, you see much more avant-garde framing, this bird's eye view of a, of a shoemaker. And you see the stories of, of girls and women and even in his iconic images of religious young students, here is the published image on the cover of the book. But for the first time with the negatives, we were able to see the uncropped image. And all of a sudden, instead of focusing on the religious boy in the century, you see the movement and vivacity of, of, of life in the streets. And there have been many surprises. Here is one of his most iconic images. And I want to speed up, so I'm not going to tell you how I found him, but I did find him. <laughs> His name is Jacob Weiss. It's a, it's a, a whole different story. And um, he, his name has been Jake, had been Jacob Eckstein, and it was changed to Jacob Cornerstone, and then to Jacob. It's, it's a long story. But 
he is one of about 25 people who we've identified as subjects in Fish and images. And this is one of the reasons why I am imploring all of you to reach out to anyone you know who might be a survivor to come and tell us their stories and access these negatives. Um, he's actually a Buddhist who lives in the Catskills. Vishnia um, captured the photo on the left, all, they all perished in Auschwitz. And that is generally true. He photographed the poorest Jews in Poland. 98% of the poorest Jews in Poland did perish in the war. But the story of David Eckstein Cornerstone Weiss and his survival and life as a Buddhist in the Catskills tells a different story. And it helps us to understand the richness of the lives that Vishniak was photographing. Um, there's moving film footage that he also took. I'm not going to show it to you because we don't have time. But I urge you to go to the exhibitions that film footage is in both of them. He, um, his photographs were considered so important to the JDC that they spent enormous sums of money supporting his, well actually while I'm talking I'll play for you. Um, the mm -hmm. JDC spent enormous sums of money supporting uh, his photography. And at a time when money meant life, it meant a visa, it meant exit and safety and refuge, they were spending thousands and thousands of dollars on Vishniak's photographs because they worked, because they affected policy and they helped raise money for the plight of these communities. At 1938, they realized that they could kind of step it up by hiring him to make films that they could screen for these fundraisers. And so that's where this moving film footage came from. The original films that he took were lost, but the outtakes, the cutting room floor kind of rejects, have been slowly found and pieced together based on their reference to his photographs. And so that's what we have in the exhibition, and I urge you to go and see more of that. Um, we also have the earliest known prints from his first ever exhibition. I was called by Howard Greenberg, who's the great um, photo uh, gallerist and dealer in New York, and he said that he had met a man who had the pho photographs from Vishniak's first ever exhibition. And I said, well, no, we have those in New York already. We have them in the archive. And he said, no, this guy is saying that he has them um, from 1938. And his first exhibition in New York was in 1942, so I was very confused. I went to meet this man named Phil Allen. I go to his apartment, and he pulls out this like, box from under a futon, and I realize like, no one knows where I am, and I'm alone in this room with a strange man who's like, pulling this thing out. From, it was, uh, you know, I, at that moment, I thought, I don't know if I'm going to make it. But what he did is he pulled out this old stained box and opened it up, and there were 16 of the most beautiful prints printed by Vishniak in the bathtub of his apartment in 1938 in Berlin and then annotated in German with his fountain um, pen on the back that reads, fish is the favorite food of the Jewish table. I can't read it from your kosher table. Um, but it shows that he was actually a master printmaker. And they're the only surviving examples of his prints before he came to America. These images were printed in Berlin in his bathtub and then shipped to the JDC offices in New York. Phil Allen's father had been the head of PR and marketing. So they were stapled to the walls of the JDC so that donors, philanthropists, and board members could pass them every day. And he moved to provide more support. Here you see um, a young woman in a factory um, in Lodz, which is kind of like the Pittsburgh of Eastern Europe. Vishnik also made maquettes books that were advertising the good works of the JDC. So here he wrote this book in a uh, pictorial visit to the Jewish children of Poland, Toes. Toes was the Polish Jewish health organization. And he wrote this essay that had been translated, where every single um, image is referenced in parentheses. So it's these poor children live in basement dwellings. They don't have food. They don't have shelter. Um, they live in horrible conditions. But they go to the summer camp, and they get healthy food, and they play, and they have sunshine, and they make friends. He glued 90 of these um, prints into a book, and he shipped it to New York. And these were supposed to be produced to raise money for these Jewish summer camps uh, for poor urban children. And then the war hit, and this languished in, a, languished in a box in New York for 70 years until we found it and have included it in the exhibition and start to understand the purpose of the original commission and the original reception of his work. Um, he also took photographs of uh, Jewish, Polish Jews who were living in Germany who were ejected by the German government in 1938 in October. And then when they got to Poland, the Poles said, we will not take them. And they were stuck in this no man's land kind of border town called Zabonshin. And there are a bunch of stories that go with these images, but I do want to rush through them. And Hans is going to talk about this work, but I, I will tell you how we found it. And then he will talk about the Jewish <coughs> material, which I'm very excited about. We found these um, contact sheets, which are um, prints the size of the negative, two and a quarter inches big, like this. And it was really confusing, because every time I showed them to someone, they looked like Zionist Halutz photos of pioneers in Palestine. But he didn't go to Israel until the 60s. 
and we could not figure out what they were until we saw the wooden clogs and realized that he was taking photos. Oh. Can everyone hear over that? I'll just, I'll just talk louder. Um, we realized that he was taking photographs of um, Zionist agrarian like youth training camps in the Netherlands. And Hans is going to talk about that in more detail. But it shows that he was using a radically different style than the style that he was employing in Eastern Europe at the same time. That he was, in fact, a much more versatile photographer than what's been previously known. At this point in the end of 1938, it was too dangerous to go back to Western Europe. And so he remained uh, to Eastern Europe, and so he remained in the West. He was in France. You'll recognize the Notre Dame. This is his mother and his father, who by this point were living um, in hiding in the south of France. And he took these kind of whimsical beach scenes in Marseille and in Nice. And his final commission for the JDC was to photograph and make film footage of Oric, which was a, a technical training school in the south of France. Shortly thereafter, he was captured and interned in a French internment camp as a foreigner, not a Jew, which is what saved him. His family was able to actually gather the very last of their resources and wealth and buy him out of this uh, camp where he had sent telegrams. He gave his negatives right before he was interned to his friend, Walter Beer, who was a German man who had gotten a visa to go to Cuba with his family. He gave the negatives to Walter and he said, get these somehow to America. Walter Beer did get them to America, and at the same time, Vishniak and his family were able to get out. Here's a picture of them on the boat. They left from Lisbon in 1940, and they arrived on 1941, New Year's Day, um, on the New York Harbor. And he immediately set about building a portrait studio on the Upper West Side, taking photos of Einstein and Chagall. Here's the famous Yiddish theater actress, Molly Picot. He was trying to make ends meet using his connections in the German and um, Russian Jewish expat community, taking photos of Einstein and Chagall, perhaps their most famous expats, so that those images could be used to advertise his services as a portrait photographer. He's taking pictures of Jewish dancers, um, integrated nightclubs, flamenco dancers, singers, comedians. Here's an advertisement for his portrait studio. And then his negatives were returned to him. And immediately upon being returned to him, he started to write letters. This is a letter to President Roosevelt inviting him to his exhibitions, saying, photographs that I took of the communities that are being murdered are being exhibited in New York. Please come. Got a note back saying, thank you for the photos. He wrote to Eleanor Roosevelt. Within a year of arriving in America, he was exhibiting his work and showing them to Jewish survivors and immigrants who were looking at the faces of people who were being murdered. And the meaning of his work shifted, and it shifted very quickly. Think about the journey that his work took from 1935 to 1938 when it was commissioned as the product of the documentary assignment to pick poverty. In 1944, when they were exhibited in New York, they were used as a kind of um, desperate cry to draw attention to the plight of the Jews who were being murdered and to argue for American interventionism. And by 1947, when they were published for the first time, they became the final photographic record of an annihilated people. This is the arc of his work and its reception and meaning in 10 years. And so that is one of the, the goals of the exhibition. And the archive is to look not only at the images, but the evolving reception of that work and how it has formed contemporary memory. And just to zoom you through in two minutes. He also documented um, successive waves of refugees arriving on American shores. Again, for Jewish social service organizations, um, immigration organizations. Here's a photograph he took of a family with these three sisters, the Gumprecht sisters, two of whom came to the opening of the exhibition in Amsterdam, actually. And he's taking this photograph for, um, for the National Refugee Service for their newsletter. Here's the story of them surviving on this boat that was meant for, I think, 20 people, and it said there were 1,000 people on the boat. But the next day, he took a photograph of them in Central Park. This is the work that he was doing for hire. And this was his own artistic vision. It looks like a Dan Arbus. There's this eerie, uncanny depiction of these sisters and how they're looking at him. We also found these bizarre body of images that I couldn't make sense of. Sailors in Central Park. Here's a woman operating a tool and die machine. Female auto mechanics. A market. Um, a Chinese blood bank. And I thought, what, what is going on here? 
until we found his Guggenheim application uh, grant. He applied for Guggenheim Foundation application to document the face of America at war. And this body of about 400 images, including really important images documenting um, war relief efforts in Chinatown in New York, which will be the subject of an exhibition at the Museum of Chinese in America. None of that work had ever been seen before, and it was his portfolio applying for this grant, which he didn't get. And so again, it sat in the archive. This is one example of the kind of treasures that can be found in this archive. In 1947, he went back. He, was, he got divorced from his first wife, Luta, and this, uh, as soon as they became citizens in 1947, they went to Las Vegas, they got a divorce. He goes back to Europe in 1947 to take photos of the displaced persons camps, uh, including this is the DP camp where my own mother was raised. So for me, this is a very personal discovery. He took photographs of about 15 to 20 displaced persons camps, and so far we've only identified five of them because of train station signs and notices. So just out of sheer luck, one of the DP camps that we were able to identify was the one Schlachtensee outside of Berlin where my mother spent four years of her life. This is the courtyard. And this is what he was sent to do. Here is a girl with a food package, a JVC food package. And in fact, all the food that my mother ate from the ages of two to five were the contents of JVC food packages. And he's taking these photographs to show American donors. So they will send clothing and send food and send money for relief. And here you can see um, the contact strips. After the war, he stopped cutting his negatives into individual squares. So now we had strips. And so you can see what the advertisement looks like. Here's this little girl, and here's all the food that's going to sustain her. He also started to make substantive annotations about people and their names and their families and what they'd gone through and who they were looking for. This is an um, orthodox displaced persons camp in France in a chalet. And here he's sanding a roller to make matzah. And uh, a girl who is waiting to get out, she's gotten a ticket, she's going out, and here they are on the ship about to leave the French harbor. At the same time that he was documenting Jewish um, <coughs> displaced persons and refugees in Europe on behalf of the JDC and also the Yiddish Daily Forward, which was a Yiddish newspaper, he was also documenting the destruction of Berlin. Berlin in ruins, he went back to his former hometown and even his former area of Wilmersdorf and he documented the ruins of his former home. I think these are among his most accomplished images, and again, they have never been published. Here you can see um, the building on Parisistrasse where his apartment used to be, and here it was when he photographed it after the war. These are, I think, among his most moving and poignant images. One of the reasons he went back, and this is where we get to the Valentine's Day romance that I promised you, so thank you for holding on, now you get the romance, um, was to find Edith Ernst. Edith Ernst had been his pre-war mistress, and um, in 1947 he found her, she survived the war, and he married her, and he brought her back to America. One of the great treasures in the, in the archive was the boxes and boxes of images of Edith that spanned 70 years. They met when she was 19 and he was 24, and they were, um, they were lovers all through the 20s and 30s, and then he came to America and went back and found her in the 40s. What you see through those photographs are not only his love for Edith, but also that he was experimenting with different approaches to modernism through his photographs of her. And again, none of these have ever been shown before because Mara was uncomfortable, obviously, with the fact that this was his, his her mother's, her father's mistress. Um, and she understands that this work is important and that it should be seen, but she said, please wait until I'm not here anymore so I don't have to see it or read about it. <laughs> um, and so she, as I mentioned, died in December and we're showing this work with her blessing for the first time. I think it's really important to understand the Edith work. And if Mara had not put that restriction on the archive, I would have included a lot of this work in the exhibition. What I had wanted to do was one case that shows several of the Edith images. And the reason for that is not for the salacious thing of like, this is his mistress, but because she was not Jewish, and so it was illegal to, for a Jew and a Gentile to have sexual relations after the Nazi rise to power. And so they would meet up in these Swiss chalets and have these kind of illicit flings. And he would experiment with different approaches to modernism with his camera. So this kind of pictorialist vision. You can see she's holding cherries in her mouth. He was playful, and he was really experimental. And in some cases, he wasn't very successful. 
But he was trying to find his voice, and he was clearly aware of different modernist approaches to depicting the nude figure. And he was using Edith's body as a locus for those experimentations. And I think it's important in understanding that he was aware of those movements and that he was trying to test his own skills and abilities in his photographs of Edith. So now I can show those images for the first time, which is pretty exciting. And I think you can see that, again, this is an added piece of his versatility that has, until today, never before been seen. We have over 1,700 of these images. Um, I think Edith is a woman's story is also remarkable and needs to be told, but that is for a different lecture. But I wanted to also honor that she really was his partner. When she came, he came to America in 1947, she worked with him and supported him in the lab and helped him with his tools and helped him with his papers and helped him with his cameras and his lenses. And here she is holding up the light in the lab, working with him. She, she was hired by the um, Jewish Cancer Institute to document, to, to Vishank was hired to look at how a new cancer treatment uh, facility functioned, and she was the model. She got into the bed and pretended to be the patient. She was really his partner in all of this, and honoring her role in that now that we have access to these photographs is, I think, important, and I thought it would be a nice kind of fun way to talk about Valentine's Day. Um, when he came back to America with Edith, he was still trying to make ends meet, so he took bar mitzvah photographs, and here's Edith on the roof right after Israel is established. Jewish gyms, community houses, Jewish nursing schools, hospitals, foundations for the blind. Um, this is a Holocaust survivor who removed her tattoo shortly after he took the photograph, and her children and grandchildren came to the opening in New York. And then he uh, resumed his life as a scientist. And from 1950 until he died in 1990, he focused on scientific research, his pioneering color photomicroscopy, which you'll see in both exhibitions, the Jewish Museum and the Photographer's Gallery. His images were featured on the cover of Life, Omni, Science, Nature magazine hundreds of times. And he became a trailblazer in the field of using polarized and colored light to magnify and, and understand um, microscopic worlds. Here's the famous Karsh portrait of him and his business card, and here's the skin from his thumb. And this is what his slides look like. We have 10,000 of them. And this in and of itself, I think, would be the subject of an amazing book. So I want to end by um, honoring Mara and her contribution, because this is the first time I'm talking about Vishniak um, since she's no longer with us. And it's because of her and her gift to ICP and the Holocaust Museum that we're able to have this exhibition and talk about this work and see this much broader body of work. If not for Mara and the lifelong advocacy of Vishniak and his work, we would only know the 250 published images from Eastern Europe. And it's because of her that we have this tremendous body of work and that now people can start to mine this incredible body of material. So we're going to have questions, but at the end. Um, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as Maya already told you, Roman Fischniak is best known for the series he did in the 1930s on the small and traditional Eastern European Jewish communities that were doomed to vanish and that have indeed, as we all now know, been exterminated almost completely by the Nazis and their accomplices. Foreseeing this fate, Fischniak used his camera for what it is good at, preserving in images what was doubtlessly or probably going to change or disappear in reality. And in the past, before Fischniak took as a camera, photography had already proven to serve a goal like that very well. Here are two examples from the 19th century. The left, Marville, Paris, 1870s, and on the right, Glasgow slums by Thomas Allen around roughly the same time. The Eastern European photos Fischner took in the 1930s are the best known part of his oeuvre. Maya has already explained that. Some years ago, after his archive had been transferred to the ICP in New York, other lesser known parts were being um, made accessible and researched published and exhibited as well. <coughs> and among those other parts were the photographs, and I think there were about 60 in total, he had made in the Netherlands in or around 1938. 
And this series depicts an agrarian youth training camp, called in Dutch Werkdorp Nieuwersluis, in the north of Holland, where young Jewish refugees from Austria and Germany were trained to build a new life in Palestine or elsewhere. And this training camp opened its gates in 1934 and could house some 300 young people at a time who were each supposed to stay for some two years. And after Germany occupied the Netherlands in 1940, the Werkdorp was cleared in 1941. The majority of those who were then living there died during the war. Others had left before and were safe. Before this fatal turn in history, the Werkdorp training camp housed an enthusiastic, hard-working and optimistic group of pioneers, nearly 700 over the years, I believe. The project was known abroad as a well-run organization that was regarded as a model and an example. It was funded by the Jewish Joint Distribution Committee and other Jewish relief organizations. The differences between the two series, the one made in Eastern Europe and the one in Holland, the, the differences are remarkable. A vanished world echoes the pictorialist style that had become fashionable around 1900, like the two from the book and the exhibition The Vanished World, shown here. The Eastern European photos are often soft focus or out of focus and have therefore sometimes a nostalgic atmosphere. They are even a bit sentimental sometimes, like this one. The Dutch Werkdorf series from 1938 is shot in a much more modern way, using low vantage points and stressing the dynamics of a community being built from scratch by young people aspiring to a better future that seemed within grasp. How can we explain the vast difference between two sets of photographs made by the same person and roughly around the same time? But maybe it's a bit different. Should we be surprised by the fact that one photographer could produce such different bodies of work in such a short span of time? Well, I've only some ten minutes to dwell upon the, the issues like this, so please don't expect a full and final answer. But I will try to give a few professional remarks on this topic. Until quite recently, Many people thought of photography as a means to produce realistic and neutral images. And the further we go back in history, the stronger that idea is. Only gradually, in the course of the 20th century, people came to understand and realize something more was involved than just a mechanical device, a camera, some chemical substances, and a certain amount of light. And as a consequence, the part played by the photographer's own individual vision and feelings was increasingly acknowledged. In the 1920s and 1930s, new generations of young photographers started to use all possibilities a camera could offer, from uncommon vantage points to darkroom experiments, like these two. On the left, you will see a Laszlo Molly Nutsch photograph from Marseille in 1928, and on the right, Man Ray from the electricity series, an advertising series from the early 1930s, with a few negatives superimposed to create a very new image. <coughs> the art world that had kept photography at an arm's length for many decades admitted for the first time, since photography had been invented some 80 years ago, uh, before, that the new medium was capable of giving an artistically interesting and fresh new imagery. And when Fischniak took his Dutch photographs in the late 1930s, this idea was still relatively new. The old pictorialist style that was contested and pushed back by the new modernism in photography was, however, not yet dead. It still served the goals photographers set themselves very well from time to time. Hence, it was possible that one and the same photographer could deliberately work in both styles. Moreover, even within the Bergdorf series, Fischniak used both the more modernist style and the more traditional pictorialist imagery. 
like these two. And maybe we should realize the boundaries between the two approaches were less clearly defined than has often been claimed by contemporaries. It is, after all, only human to emphasize or overemphasize the differences with another generation as long as the battle between the two was still being fought out and each had to defend its position. There are more examples of this half-hearted embracing of the modernist approach. The Hungarian-born Dutch photographer Eva Besnieu, who was a dis discipline of modernist photography, admitted she could not always resist making romantic pictures, however much she detested her precursors for doing the same thing. Here we have two of her photographs. On the left one she made in Berlin in the early 1930s, and on the right somewhat later in Holland, later in the 1930s. And here another one on the left from Bestieu, left Berlin and right in Holland. Another example is the young Dutch graphic designer Paul Schuitema, who was one of the very first to incorporate photographs into his book, brochure and poster designs. These two were made by him in 1928. And a decade later, <coughs> He also did this book, uh, roughly translated as What the Netherlands is Proud of. <coughs> the color photo was made by himself in the same polder where the Derek Dorp, that Fischner photograph, was located. And although the caption in Schreiter's book stresses the fact that a modern machine was being used, <coughs> the picture itself is rather traditional or old fashioned like most photographs in this booklet. In this particular case, the stylistic turn that Schreitzma took between, say, 1928 and 1940, when this book came out, may be explained by the changed situation. This book appeared in either November or December 1940, shortly after the Germans occupied the Netherlands. And this may have led Schreitzma to a more traditional nationalistic and patriotic approach that emphasized the unique qualities of his native country even to the extent that he returned to an approach he had fought in the 1920s. In other words, a photographer sometimes reacts to circumstances that define the ways photographs are being made. Moreover, photographs could easily be reused or even abused and be given a very different meaning. And that is the case with some photographs made in the same polder again, the same polder where the Veritop was uh, located where Fischner photographed, at the same time by Charles Breyer and Cas Waters, two Dutch photographers, who worked for a left-wing weekly. But after the Germans occupied Holland, the Germans and their Dutch followers used the publisher's stock <coughs> in a completely different context in a magazine called Hammer, Hammer a magazine <coughs> devoted to the Nazi cause. This one is from that magazine, and this one as well. Again, people from the same area where the very top and new slice was located. <coughs> Breyer and Orthuis, who made these before in the late 1930s, were unable to stop them with the Germans from using and abusing their own photographs. And these two photographers' style proved to serve more than one goal. That may have been a shock for Orthuis and Bray themselves, but it was a hard lesson. Photographic modernism was used indistinguishably by both the Nazi and the communist press, regardless of the vast ideological differences between them. The image of a hard-working people was cherished and used by both sides to express their ideology. These two are pages from a book called Deutschland, Germany, published in 1936, that propagandized a work ethic that should help to realize the Third Reich. And here we have a cover and a spread on the right-hand side from a Russian magazine published in four languages, 
Russian, French, English, and German, and later in Spanish as well. It's a beautifully designed and very well printed, carefully printed publication that suggested a lot of progress was being made in transforming Russia into a leading industrial power. And whether we like it or not, Fischnyuk's heroic imagery was not his own invention. The differences between these pictures are not that big. Both pictorialism and modernism could be used for different goals by people with very different ideological ideas. That makes it less peculiar for art that Fischnyuk alternated between pictorialism and modernism as well, like we did here. The left hand side, two pages from the book A Vanished World, made in Central and Eastern Europe, and on the right hand, an image you already saw, um, made in Holland in 1938. But there is something more. Pictorialism and modernism were not just stylistic approaches that were current or fashionable or useful and therefore broadly embraced. Clients often left their mark <coughs> as well, and Maya has already been talking about it a bit as well. The Jewish Joint Distribution Committee that supported the Bergdorp and commissioned Fischer to photograph it had also sent him on this assignment to Eastern Europe a few years before to photograph the now famous series The Finnish World. They probably had a say in how Fischnyak should go about, and they may well have had different ideas. In the Dutch Werkdorp, an optimistic image was needed. It was all about a young generation that had to be enabled to start a new life elsewhere. In Eastern Europe, however, the GDC, the largest Jewish relief organization, aimed at drawing attention to the poverty and the desperate situation of so many Eastern European Jews. Fischnack was probably asked to stress that aspect of Jewish life. At least, that's the part he highlighted. Both the Vanish World and the Dutch series give a very specific, highly selective image. In the Vanish World, Fischnack predominantly depicted the small, poor, and orthodox communities and largely kept out the urbanized, assimilated Jewish population in the big cities. In order to advance the Jewish Joint Distribution Committee's mission to support them, as Maya already explained. In the Dutch series, we mostly see men at work, hardly any women, and hardly any sport, leisure, or study activities. And such selectivity is not unusual in photography. On the contrary, photography has often been used to, con to convey a certain one-sided image. The German and Russian examples I just gave are only two examples, but in a free and democratic Western world, it was used in the same way. The American Farm Security Administration series is perhaps the best known example, and that's why Maya already told, uh, showed it as well. This governmental bureau helped the impoverished and unemployed farmers and farm works in the United States from the southern Dust Bowl states. Photographs were used to justify the governmental intervention in the course of things, which was, and still is, a sensitive topic in the US. The part played and the influence exercised by organizations or commercial companies or political parties and so on has been underestimated and neglected for a long time in photo history. Many books on individual photographers and their careers tend to consider them as people who do their jobs independently as if unhindered by any restrictions. And that is understandable. If someone decides to write a book or an article on a certain photographer, he or she is naturally inclined to have a high opinion of that photographer's work. Why would you otherwise spend so much time researching a single photographer? Deservedly, much more attention has been given to outside influences in the past decades, however. Like wishes clients may have, like the Jewish Joint Distribution Committee. Even 
if it regrettably reduces the freedom often attributed to photographers in photo historical literature, it can and should not be denied. And it proves the versatility of photography as a medium, maybe rather than the versatility and mental acrobatic power of individual photographers. After all, when the situation calls for another approach, many photographers are inclined <coughs> and willing to do simply whatever is required from them. And that may sound a bit unfriendly towards <coughs> photographers, but up until Fischniak's time, photographers had hardly any status. They had rarely any say in how their photos were being used. <coughs> they were not always asked for their opinion either. So it was probably not just the subject itself that called for a different style, and Fischniak uh, did his two series, or a photographer's own taste, but rather the circumstances, in this case the purposes these particular photographs were meant to serve. Well, I could easily dwell much longer on this topic of how much freedom photographers were allowed to maneuver and to do as they wished for the best at certain points in history. But let me for now conclude that there's much more to documentary or documentary looking photographs like those uh, made by Fischniak than we sometimes think at first glance. However much we appreciate the historic qualities of Fischniak's work, and regardless of the subjective powers it had at the time and still has, the meaning of any single photograph should never be taken for granted. Thank you so much. I, I too want to thank everyone who made this occasion possible. It was pretty complex, actually. Um, and um, I'm very grateful to be here. Um, and thank you for coming out on Valentine's Day. Um, and I just even particularly want to thank Maya for maybe 10 years or more of passionate discussion, um, beginning with Vishniak and ranging all over photography um, and continuing. And I think that you can see from seeing what you saw at the exhibition and hearing both Maya and the work that her work inspires, you can really see why. So I'm going to share with you the fact that 45 years ago, Roman Vishniak gave a master's tea at Yale University's Calvin College. Shortly before, a large Vishniak show at the Jewish Museum in New York City had exhibited his experiments in photomicroscopy and his films about biology, along with some of the images of the Jews of Eastern Europe. At Yale, the room was crowded and overflowing with students and people were sitting on the floor, literally at his feet, including me. No doubt this posture exaggerated the impression that Vishniak made on me. He was like a sage, pronouncing truths that had barely escaped from the maw of an impossible and unimaginable past. He spoke without pause, intent to share his experiences with the gathered young. despite the obvious fact that his wife was standing behind him, very concerned that he was becoming exhausted. And I quote him, sometimes, he said, I was just in prison, just for making <coughs> photographs. It was easily understood that his life in photography was urgent and important. But the double just, what could that mean? How could someone be just imprisoned, just for making photographs? Either the photographs were portentous and forbidden, and the word just was ironic, or prison was a kind of joke and not a serious impediment to making the photographs. The sentence contained something puzzling, like a double negative, but much more powerful. Over the years, that peculiar sentence echoed in my head, prompting further research. There were several monographs of his work including A Vanished World, which came out in 1983. Vishniak's photographs had been shown in the Family of Man exhibition and were included in the widely circulated catalog. And in 1990, some of them were installed permanently in the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. 
There were also several publications that focused on his photographs of, photo of microscopic animals, another vast area of his photographic work, and I was familiar with all of these. And from what Vishniak said and what I found elsewhere, I concluded these things. One, in the 1930s, Roman Vishniak had a premonition of the coming destruction of Eastern European Jews. He set out to save at least an image of their otherworldly way of life. Two, the Jews whose images he was trying to preserve did not want to be photographed, so Vishniak used a hidden camera. Three, Vishniak made thousands of these photographs, but large numbers of them were lost or destroyed or impounded when he tried to enter the United States. Four, photographing on Kristallnacht, Vishniak wore a stolen Nazi uniform. His famous image of a terrified little girl records an encounter <coughs> between the photographer and a child who was looking at a Nazi, looking at her. Five, several times Vishniak was arrested while photographing, and he was also in prison for being a spy. Each time he escaped, sometimes narrowly, saving <coughs> his own life. And finally, it seemed evident to me that Vishniak was a master of what I've come to call proleptic memory, that is, memory ahead of itself. In a prophetic mode, Vishniak was attempting to thrust the images of the present forward into the future so that there would be at least a chance for it to be remembered after its existence would have been violently extirpated. The published information on the Vishniak canon supported all these interpretations. But doubts would surface also. It seemed possible that the views of penniless life in Poland were scripted in certain ways. <coughs> For example, in the Vishniak images that were widely distributed in the United States, the Eastern European Jews, blinded by their poverty, piety, and loyalty to, to, to tradition, seem unaware of what is happening in the rest of the world. But this itself could also be, have been a strategic pose, adopted partly out of self-denial or denial, and partly out of self-defense by the American Jewish community. Antti Jezerska's 1925 novel, The Bread Givers, for example, gives a, a, a way that this could work. She describes a hard bargain that United States, the United States drove immigrants to make. Until the 1880s, unlike many other nations in Europe and elsewhere, the United States maintained pathways to citizenship for a certain number of persons born and despised in other places, Eastern European Jews amongst them. These paths were steadily narrowed by the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, the General Immigration Act of 1882, the Alien Contact Labor Laws of 1885 and 1887, and the Immigration Act of 1924. Andrzej Zerska's family had come in 1890, having sent the oldest son ahead six years before. But the price demanded for what for Price demanded for their move was to affirm that life in the United States was much better than life in one's home village, even if the truth was much more complicated. A real American could not also be true to the old world home. What truth does the collected canon of Vishniak's published photographs proclaim? It seems to me it's an immigrant's truth of an obsolete old culture, forsakeable for the new, a truth both instrumental and compelled. There also existed certain, pa certain patterns or repetitions in the Vishniak canon, we have to realize this is all before um, Maya's work, that reflect, in the, that, that reflect those stories of the Jewish immigrants told of escape from Europe. For example, many of the images repeat the trope of solidarity among men of the spirit and the pious women who accept, accept the duty to support them. The group's cohesion is assumed. This construction is also common in the oral histories of the Holocaust. For instance, there's a story of how mothers in hiding would inadvertently smother their infants in their arms because they held them so tightly against their bodies to prevent the infants from crying out and giving away the group's hiding place. My own father-in-law, an immigrant from Romania, spoke once of how his family had hidden he spoke only once of how his family had hidden in the fields around their town during the pogroms in Romania. Horribly, he remembered, once a mother in their group had smothered her infant in just that way, afraid that it might cry. 
this was a harrowing image for a little boy to carry with him for the rest of his life, and I empathized when he told it. But it is notable that this incident appears in many stories and testimonies. It is told in Holocaust testimonies about hidden newborns in the camps, for instance, and it is told in Art Spiegelman's graphic novel, Mouse. The chilling permutation of this story exists in a family diary that the historian Judith Greenberg has just prepared for publication. There, members of a group of Jews hiding in an attic threaten to smother the baby themselves if the mother does not keep it quiet. Greenberg recounts the following experience of Sipra and her baby Rachel in the, in the ghetto in August 1942. Sipra and Rachel hit Raquel, sorry, hid in an attic during a roundup or an action. They crowded in that attic with about 100 other Jews. When Raquel tried, cried, the terrified Jews did not want to alert the Ukrainian and German soldiers who were searching for all Jews, and they threatened to kill baby Raquel if she didn't stop crying. In response, Sipra threatened him to scream and give them all away if they touched her child. She and Raquel survived that action, and then Sipra snuck Raquel out of the ghetto to her friends who raised her during the war. So are all these stories of smothered babies true? No doubt. Are all of them true, or true exactly as told? It is certainly possible, but it may also be questioned if so many mothers smothered so many infants in virtually the same way exactly throughout the years of terror. Zipper's diary hints at further complications. Nevertheless, neither are they lies. Memories like these are shapes collectively crafted to contain the meaning of barely comprehensible personal and collective trauma. They surmise and then they symbolize what must have happened when hearing, seeing, and understanding failed. They are post-traumatic reconstructions that communicate the degree of panic and desolation that the victims felt. I have come to understand them as parables of terror. Because they transfer affect so forcefully, sometimes they can communicate more truth than the dispassionate facts alone. They are the form into which collective memory. They are sorry. They are the form into which collective memory has shaped itself around the murderous past. Paradoxically, their existence bespeaks despair, but their repetition performs community. The particular and often repeated version of pre-Holocaust Europe that takes place in the Vishnya canon contains an ascent to this form of discourse. The common view of the old world Jew as an exotic other that is contradicted is also contradicted by two paradigmatic photographs from a vanished world. They are titled, My Coachman, Slonim. Let's see. Um, let's see. Okay. My Coachman, Slonim, and a plate of the Kristallnacht, November 9th to 10th, 1938, Berlin. As a framing device, these two images encapsulate Vishniak's pre- and post-war challenges. They represent two entirely different kinds of photographic truth and highlight the problem of pre presenting an interpretation that has to be both sentiment and testament at once. Like the double just in the resonant and mysterious sentence or the complicated story of the, t the smothered babies <coughs> that point to a multiple that is greater than the sum of its parts. In this first photograph, the driver poses in the sunshine, still and dignified before Vishniak's camera. His face is lined with wrinkles, his shirt is dirty, and his vest fits badly. He stands in front of some buildings in town, looking elsewhere. At the same time, the half-smile on his face is inviting, lending the soft tenderness to his eyes that is a Vishniak trope for the spirituality of poor Polish Jews. Vishniak wrote, quote, I had to visit Slona, the birthplace of my father. It was pouring when my much-delayed train poured into pulled into the station. At the far end of a large square was a lonely figure, and it proved to be the coach driver. He took me to a small inn, and when I asked how much, he responded that I should pay him on my departure. I remained longer than I thought I would, and took many pictures. Several days later, I was ready to depart, and the coachman brought me back to the station. I asked him what the fare was for the two trips, and he cried bitterly, for the trips? For the trips? Only for the two trips? Is that all? I was astonished. What else had he done for me? He was wringing his hands and he was wailing. Who will pay for the freezing nights I waited? For the nights when nobody came and for my suffering? My wife was sick. 
and my child died. I had to borrow money for a tiny coffin. I tried to say something. Was I responsible for his misfortunes? Fate demanded a response. I embraced the coachman, turned my pockets out, and gave him all the money I had. He cried and blessed me. I had to run to catch the moving train. The text of Vishnat provides for this photograph is essentially a fable from the mythical town of Helm. Vishniak is a stranger who comes to the town of Slonim from a big city far away, and he believes he has hired the coachman simply for two trips, one from the train to the inn and the other from the inn back to the train. The coachman, however, misunderstands or chooses to understand differently, and at the end of the visit, he demands payment for all the days between. The, con the contract, as the coachman represents it, is a retainer, bounded not by or limited to the initial and final trips. In this contract between the businessmen, the two businessmen, the one that should win is the worldly rich man, but this time the one that will win is the poor country Jew. His dominance is due to the wily way he stirs up the pitying sentimentality of the urban man, himself a father, by demanding that he, the coachman, is so destitute as not to be able to pay for the funeral of his own child, who died while the coachman was attending to Vishniak. The photographer is shown to be a fool, caught by his own pretensions. While the photographer takes a picture of it to several peasants, the peasant takes the measure of the photographer and gets himself paid. The photographer taken alone, the photograph taken alone, encourages a view of the coachman as an absolute, obsolete <coughs> world icon, excluded by modernity, and thus fated to be trapped in the murderous vortex of European Jewish history. But the story, no doubt, is also true. It is a test for the reader of which to adopt. In the second photograph, let's see, how do I? Great. In the second photograph, a small girl cowers in terror uh, in a corner, terrified of what she sees. In this publication, Vishniak's caption reads, Kristallnacht, November 9th and 10th, 1938, Berlin. This is the one where she's seeing a Nazi. Yet the Nazi she sees, apparently, is not in fact what she is looking at, because the text also asserts that the photographer at whom she is looking is Roman Vishniak himself, disguised in a Nazi uniform, taking street photographs of Kristallnacht. He says in the text, accompanying this image, quote, I marched in Nazi uniform to record this awful event in still and motion pictures. The photograph purportedly functions as an emblem of the terror unleashed by that episode. What is happening on the streets of Berlin may be outside of the frame, but its import is conveyed in the horror of the child. Like the forsaken coachman in the world about to be destroyed, this image has become an icon of that horror. Strictly speaking, however, it is also an image of the violence of the practice of photography itself on the occasion of Kristallnacht and otherwise. Vishniak presents for consumption a calculated construction that is and is not as it seems. Vishniak had asked a group of several children to pose for him making frightened faces, and this little girl rather brilliantly obliged. Mm -hmm. Vishniak was not making street photographs during Kristallnacht dressed as a, in a stolen Nazi uniform when he took this photograph. Neither did he take his photographs with a hidden camera as he often asserted. For example, quote, the homeless man eyed me suspiciously as always my camera was hidden. The status of this photograph as simulacrum, a copy for which there is no original, is a mirror of a whole body of his work and therefore also it has that kind of truth. Such parables in the Vishniak corpus coalesce into a negative epiphany. Very few of the stories Vishniak told about his photographs are precisely true. But then again, neither are they entirely false. Vishniak made compelling photographs of a vibrant population of Eastern European Jews before the Holocaust, of verdant farms, sunny villages, and modern cities, and of communication links with the world beyond. Like the documentary images, produced at about the same time in the United States by the Farm Security Administration. They clearly denote the deserving poor. After all, this was the task that the Joint Distribution 
committee had set. But they were largely, these were largely, this task was largely set aside, and so the question becomes one of translation. Not only is our ability to understand what Vishniak saw at issue, but our understanding of the history of photography as well. In the 1930s, the meaning of the photographic document was not yet as it, the way it is now understood, as an unmanipulated imprint sharply divided from performative pictures. Social service organizations at this time, like the ones for which Vishniak worked, also freely created scenes for photographers to shoot, often representing them as before and after appeals for charitable support. In this context, Vishniak's staged images from Eastern Europe do not read as undocumentary. In fact, in the United States, um, it is not until the extensive distribution of the documentary photographs of the FSA that the need to demonstrate strict adherence to forensic standards of evidence even begins to take precedence. Um, during the period in which Vishniak was working in Jewish communities in Eastern Europe, people widely accepted the documentary photograph as a correlative of the real, not as a literal copy. Vishniak was clearly engaging that framework when constructing photographs such as the little girl and the Nazi, and also when he presented his images after the war to American audiences. He is configuring the truth as he knew it to the expectations of persons who had, as he assessed them, a relatively limited ability to connect to what he knew. At the same time, he is aiming beyond <coughs> the American people um, to those, uh, he, he's aiming beyond the scraps that the American people could give to those who could develop a critical eye. When I met him at the Yale T, he had just returned to the scene of his Polish photography on account of the comprehensive ex exhibition of the Jewish Museum in New York City. It was during this time that he pronounced that peculiar sentence to his youthful interlocutors. Sometimes I was just in prison just for making photographs. With the establishment of Roman Vishniak, the Roman Vishniak Archive at the ICP, and the great exhibition that commemorates this accomplishment, it may be perhaps finally possible to better understand what he meant. One interpretation is this. From prison to the strictures of social documentary photography, many things did not seem particularly salient to the Vishniak American audience at all. His were just photographs. Another is that nearing the end of his life, he belittled the difficulties and implored his young audience to carry on the search for what is true and just. Thank you. So thank you all so very, very much for three marvelously complimentary papers and your critical thrust at the end was extremely provocative. Um, I know that I'm not really chairing some, some long thing, but I think the idea is probably you're going to have a little reaction with each other before we throw everything open to the floor. Is that correct? Panel discussion. I think you want to discuss among yourselves a little bit. But I don't know, as, as, I don't know as it was my first time, to what extent you were each familiar with what you, you, you all said. So... Um, you obviously were familiar with a lot of the content of what Maya was going to say, but I don't know to what extent. I, we we didn't know. Heard, no. no. <laughs> you didn't. So that's very interesting. So, so there is a little moment for, mm -hmm. for interaction between you. Mm. Well, I will say I was thinking when I was making the distinction between modes of truth of what you were telling us about modes of photographic production that are demanded as signs of truth by different institutions. I think it's really a really critically important consideration. Well, and I think Fisher is a good case in point. I mean, the thing I tried to stress was that for a long time, like I said, people were assuming that photographers were working on really on their own independently, and then only afterwards you learn other things are involved as well, and the Fischer case, well, is a case for that uh, to show how much, how important commissioners, uh, clients are, um, and how, how that influences the work that he does. And that's that's the marvelous job that you have done with the book and the exhibition to opening up the, the archive and 
very often we only know a very small part of someone's oeuvre. Uh, it's not only with Fischnack, but very often that's the case. And now we know so much more. And that's, that's not, not the first time, I guess, you've been doing discoveries like this. Mm -hmm. Or... No, but it's, it's always wonderful to see different approaches enliven this question. And, and um, I think from both of your presentations, there were two pieces that were highlighted that were really revelations for me. Each time, we kind of look at it from a different angle. And the first is the question of his versatility. And mm -hmm. I think you had a, a way of engaging with that and explaining it that I hadn't previously considered. So it was wonderful. Um, because I, I tend to kind of um, look at the work from Eastern Europe is obviously referencing a kind of social documentary mm -hmm. language. And then you look at his kind of Weimar inflected avant-garde work. And then you see the uh, Werkdorp images from the Netherlands and you think, okay, well this looks like kind of Rachenko and Russian constructivist. And that he's pulling one by one. Mm -hmm. But actually there are a, a wide range of interpretive filters. and. It's not as if it's one style or another. And it was really helpful to see, like Eva Bejna, whose work I've loved for okay. years and this kind of modernist work, but then you see she was doing this pictorialist work, which I had not seen. No. Um, and I think uh, it does challenge curators whose job it is, is to find what they think is the best photograph. And often, and I'm guilty of this myself, that tends to be a kind of modernist photograph because sure, you know that's what many mm -hmm. curators like, um, and so you're not telling the whole story. Because I, I have gone through myself with the photographers, I'll go through a bin of a thousand negatives and I'll try to find the gems. And inevitably mm. that's because of my own mm. bias mm. And, and aesthetic preferences that I'll alight on the modernist work and then make a story for them being a modernist. And so I thought that you were um, very helpful in, in kind of reminding me that I need to be more careful about uh, constructing an aesthetic narrative that is very much about my own choices and, mm -hmm. the, and the story I want to tell about kind of progress and modernity. Um, and that they happen uh, side by side. So was he a, using a constructivist language, a modernist language, a pictorialist language? You know, was he also a, um, a professional photographer or, or was he a kind of um, weekend photographer? And that's also mm -hmm. a question, right? He was sent on commission, but before that, yeah. It wasn't professionalized. This was an amateur photographer. And, and do these distinctions matter? Mm -hmm. And what weight do we put on them? So I think the bias of the, of the curator or storyteller in this was something that you highlighted that mm -hmm. I hadn't really considered in okay. how we talk about Vishniak, mm -hmm. which was great. Mm -hmm. um, and with Laura's talk, which I always, I love, I mean, this is, uh, it was taken in part from her essay for the catalog, for which I'm very grateful. It was a, a different take on Vishniak. And, um, the question of, his, of the mythology surrounding his work is complex. And there have been articles that have been written in response to my research that have been really frustrating. You know, oh, so he was lying, you know, or you know, that I've kind of uncovered this lie. Mm -hmm. That was never my intention, nor is it the reality. And I think Laura did a wonderful job in highlighting that you can't respond to it that way. That there was this sense of like finally calling him out. And his daughter was quite upset. Uh, it was a very painful moment in our relationship with the New York Times Magazine profile about the work that I was doing mm -hmm. many years before the show came out. Because it talked about him um, lying, obfuscating the commission, cropping. And, and she felt that his legacy was being questioned. And, and in fact, you know, he claimed to have an MD and multiple PhDs. He didn't. He took his, claimed to take a fo um, his photographs with a hidden camera. He didn't. So how do you address those things and yet not denigrate his legacy? Um, but in fact, I think many of his best photographs were never printed or published. And that he wasn't, you know, someone would say, I have uh, recordings of him giving lectures, and someone would say, I'm from Vilna. And he'd say, oh, this is Vilna. And then, you know, months later, someone would say, I'm from Lublin. And he'd say, oh, this is Lublin. It was the same photograph. Um, but what was the purpose of that? It was because he wanted his images to resonate. He wanted people to care about these communities that he became very close to who were annihilated. Um, one of the interesting pieces of the reaction to, to the kind of uncovering of this broader Vishniak story was in this New York Times Magazine profile, there were weeks of responses and people were very angry on both sides. And I think so much of that was a projection of their own family history mm -hmm. and how yeah. they saw, thought that that was being told, particularly because those families' histories were abrogated. They were annihilated. And so it became all the more crucial to see your own story represented. So someone, I remember um, a, a, a donor gave us funding for the exhibition, but said, you know, I, I'm giving you money because I think this is a good project, but I'm not coming to this show. 
um, because we had a swimming pool and we had a tennis court and you know our families didn't look like this and this isn't our story you know and some people would say oh you know thank you for telling the truth about Vishniak because you know we had money and we were secular and we were educated and we didn't look like that and now we know the whole story and other people wrote very angrily and said this is how it was we were penniless and we had no shows and we lived in basement dwellings and everything you're doing is wrong yeah. It was all a kind of projection of their own history and what they saw represented. Even more for me as a historian, so I'm not an art, I'm a historian historian who uses photographs. I'm not an art historian. And um, so I'm, I'm less interested in tracing the path of modernism um, than I am in um, what photographs tell us about modernity, really living. I mean, I'm not sure it's that divided <laughs> thing, but. Um, they also show us what the American public was willing to listen to or willing to look at. And the, it was much easier to understand the destruction of the Jewish population in Europe as the destruction of an other. And that is what was published and republished and republished. And <coughs> nobody really wanted to hear or could even take in um, the destruction of persons so much like oneself. And I, I see that as Vishniak, as a photographer, almost photographing what his audience would see, would be willing to see, and saying, OK, so this is Lublin. Whereas I'm not sure what kinds of invitations he got to tell a different kind of more, com more complicated truth. And perhaps if the thousands of negatives if he had had them and had the time and the place, that truth would have been, I'm sure that truth would have been more complicated. But given what he had and given how he would be listened to, I think it's a real imprint of something very true and important even to us now as we think about all the refugees who are dying now. What stories are we hearing? What stories will we listen to? How can people get through to us? Could I just ask one question that came out of that? Because he obviously cared a great deal when he was labeling his um, microscopy photos. But, um, and he was obviously becoming more and more professional. So how is it that everything was just completely higgledy-piggledy shoved into a bag with all these different epochs and things and no attempt at labeling or putting things into envelopes, for example, according to you? Were there not some parts of the earth that were put into organized envelopes? Or? So it's a, it's a great question, and it's a complicated one to answer. Um, for the negatives that were brought over by Walter Beer, they were cut up that way because they were being secreted out of the country. And so it's much harder to take out strips and contact sheets and notes. And so when he, had, he heard that um, the Vichy police were looking for him, and he knew what was going to happen, and he found the closest friend who happened to have a visa to get out and very quickly cut up his negatives into individual squares. He's told stories about how he sewed them into his coat to get them out. I mean, these are not real stories, but the real story is that he gave it to this friend, Walter Beer. And in fact, right before Walter died in the 90s, he wrote a letter, which is in the exhibition, about how he secreted those negatives out. Um, and so I don't think that Vishniak was quite sure that they would survive. And then he created a story of that he took 16,000 negatives, of which only 1,500 survived, and the rest were, which is also not true, right? But there's this piece of it that is true, and it was the sense that he, w he could have lost everything. He didn't, he didn't have anything when he came to America. He trusted this one friend, and somehow the friend got it to Cuba, and then they were stuck in customs, and then they got it back to him, which is kind of miraculous. Um, that, another piece is that he wasn't particularly organized. Um, and what I saw in his negatives in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, he would, I think, and we all do this, I'm certainly guilty of this, would say, that's it, I'm organizing my life, and he would just start off, you know, it's like a new diary where you write every day and then it drops off, and he would have these fits and starts of organizing, organization systems, and there was a period where I tried to follow the thread, and I was like, this is not going to work, because it was, it was half-hearted, and then there was another piece, which was this kind of fictitious autobiographical narrative and fictitious captions, and the science work is not excluded from that. So we've had, you know, we had an um, a oncologist come and say, this isn't that. And, you know, we, we've, and, and I think he wanted people to be really excited about um, s 
seeing and learning and passion. And I've spoken to many of his former students. He was a professor of art and biology. That doesn't even exist now. It's this really interesting moment in the history of science, right? In the 50s and 60s. His business card read Professor of Art and Biology. And I've talked to a lot of his students. And they said that sometimes they thought maybe it wasn't quite right, the facts, but that what he was doing was, was sharing his passion and that that passion was infectious and that's they were, what they were getting from him. So it's a different way of looking at captions and annotations. One is to convey accurate scientific data and the other is to communicate a passion and interest and excitement. And if you look at it through that, um, you understand him a little bit better. But he had, I mean, he had major personal, um, interpersonal challenges with this as well because editors would increasingly, he would say like, oh, Trotsky signed my visa or something and he said, well, Trotsky was on the other side of the country. Mm -hmm. um, or his own grandson, who is now the executor of the estate, um, was for 40 years the chair of the political science department at Oberlin. And he was finishing his PhD at Berkeley when Vishniak was creating the captions for Vanished World. And he was, he's a historian. And he said, no, this isn't right and this couldn't be. And he didn't speak to his own grandson for years because he dared to question this narrative. He was attached to these narratives because he wanted people to care about the subject. But it's, it's complicated. Mm. But maybe there's one more thing. I mean, um, only in the 1970s, people became really interested in history photography. Before that, there were hardly yeah. any scholarly, serious research being done. So for a long time, uh, from folks working in the 1930s, like Vishniak, Robert Kappa, all kinds of stories were brought up and kept without being checked and verified and uh, yeah. etc. So that was one thing. He wasn't the only one to yeah, make up. I mean. Yeah, for instance, and, and to the following shortly by Kappa. So there are more people like him making up stories or embellishing them. And the second thing is maybe he especially was sacrificing the literal truth for a higher ideal. I mean, he sort of really served a very specific goal, um, and well, to ha hack with the literal truth of a singular particular photograph. I mean, that's, that's happening very often. I mean, we still think photographs will tell the truth, but very often there are a little, little bits off sides. And you can use it in your advantage, you can abuse it, and uh, I think this is a very good example of someone who's really using phot photography for a very important goal, and then maybe sacrificing a little bit of the very little truth of, of yeah. a single pho and photograph. You're right, it was very common at the time. Barbie Zelizer, who's a historian of photojournalism, talks about specific photographs of specific camps um, mm -hmm. that are labeled one camp one time and another count another time by the New York <laughs> Times or the you know by the reputable press and this is not seen as a contradiction. There's a our it's our understanding of photography that is the lens to look at this through. Yeah. Shall we? Yeah. Uh, yes. Sure. Yes, there's a question. I was very interested that Laura mentioned the hidden camera because mm. when Fishnap was here in eighty three we made a program with Arena on BBC television. Uh, he showed that street photography, yeah. and he said it was taken with a hidden camera. Yeah. And the BBC cameraman, who I was standing next to, turned to me and said, it's impossible. Yeah. Technically, <laughs> yeah. it's impossible. Yeah. So he was telling right. right. And he also said that he buried his negatives in France. Very interesting yeah. information. And I just wonder, what evidence do you have of the hidden camera? No, but I, as far as I understand it, it's technically uh, those images can't have been made that way. But, but aren't like but things. The, the fact you hold them down here isn't, and you're not doing this, isn't well. That something there were that's people. Yeah, yeah. You, there were. So Jacob Rees took. I mean, um, Lewis Hine, as I understand it, took photographs. Well, he certainly had a hidden <sighs> notebook in his pocket, and he would measure the height of the children in the factories by the buttons on his coat and use that to measure uh, how old the child was, roughly. And I think some of his photographs are hidden. Walker Evans was using a hidden mm, camera. Paul so Strand was using a camera with a right Two angle. Yep. And so this was, uh, oh, cor you know, this, this was something people were doing. But from what I understand, the, the Vishniak pictures are, as exactly you say, they're technically impossible. And we have about uh, 50 or 60 photos in the archive where you can actually see his reflection or shadow. With a picture. With a camera. camera like this, you're going like this. Um, and we have, um, you know, 30 plus people who remember being photographed by him. 
So in one case, there was a young boy whose father was the, um, a tailor, and he said he remembered Vishniak. What he said was he remembered Vishniak lining up the schnorrs, lining up the beggars in the town, the poorest people, and taking their photographs. He remembers because he hadn't seen a camera. So a lot of people in the poorest communities had never seen cameras, and they, and they remember him coming to town and taking these photographs. But by the 50s, he became really um, elaborate in how he explained to the press how he used this hidden camera. So there's the camera magazine, I think of 1951. He shows this trench coat where he has like a, um, a string attached to the buttonhole where he pulls it like this <laughs> and then it opens and the camera's there. And it's, it's these elaborate demonstrations because as he became well known, but he was also an immigrant who, you know, English was his fourth language, which he had to learn in his 40s, trying to make ends meet in a new country and trying to get people to care about his photographs. And as he, I think, saw that people were more interested with yeah. these stories hmm. attached to him, he told yeah. the stories. <laughs> And mm. which is, you know, it's about us. Yeah. It's yeah. about us and what we will listen to from an immigrant whose fourth language is English, who is a middle aged guy <coughs> trying to make it in a new world with pictures. It, yeah. Um, Shall we just have one more? Because I'm very worried about our very dear event stewards who might wonder <laughs> where we've got to. So, shall we have this lady in the yeah, front? Um, not to do with Vishniak, but have you heard of um, a photographer? who sadly died very young, called Chris Schwartz. Yeah. Yeah, because he was a friend of mine, actually. And I only, I discovered by accident that he'd gone to Poland and taken a lot of photos. Yeah, his photos so. are in the archive of the, in um, Kazimierz in Krakow. Yeah. There's yeah. There's a museum now that houses his archive and that he kind of helped found. Yes, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. I, I don't know what you think of his work. Well, there, um, I wouldn't put him in this category, but there are, we have this box of over 100 artist contributions to what I'm calling Vishniakia. Um, <laughs> he would not necessarily fall under that, but um, you know, people have done some very strange things. There's this one guy who makes these three-dimensional pine carvings based on Vishniak's photographs, or very commonly paintings oh, of his photographs with barbed wire over it and things like that. Um, or you know, someone tore up the vanished world and glued the heads on and then put flames. I mean, some of this actually, is, as folk art, is fascinating. But um, Chris Schwartz, uh, there are several photographers who are really reputable and accomplished photographers who have gone back um, and taken photos of what they call absence, where they've gone back to the, photo to the places that Vishniak photographed or the areas that he photographed and photographed basically places without Jews, places that, that now reflect the absence of the life that he had documented. And I think he falls into this material. Vishniak was not so keen on that. I mean, he said at some point, I don't remember the exact quote, but you know, all these young photographers are keen to, yeah. you know, f um, to follow in my footsteps and grab on my coattails. That was the expression. Mm -hmm. Grab on my coattails and go and photograph where I was. But I think part of that, um, part of that is, there's this Holocaust backshadowing that's inevitable on his work, right? Because we know that most of the people he photographed were marked for distinction, uh, for, for extinction. However, um, he was photographing Jewish life. He was not photographing death. He was photographing life in the 30s. So people who go back to photograph absence, one could say that that's antithetical to what he was documenting. And there was this um, philosopher, Moshe Halbertal, some of you might be familiar with him. Um, he's now at NYU. And we were talking about Vishniak's photographs, and he said something so resonant where he said, if you go to, he, Moshe is Israeli, and he said, if you go to any um, Israeli teenager and you say, tell me about Auschwitz, or tell me about the deportations, or tell me about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, they can tell you everything because they've learned it in school. But if you tell, tell me about Jewish Berlin in the 20s or Jewish Warsaw in the 30s, they mm -hmm. can tell you nothing. And he said, it's as if you go to someone's home, to a parent's home whose children have died in a car accident, and all you would see are pictures of the accident, which of course you wouldn't. You would see pictures of their lives. And so that was Vishniak. What he was doing was taking pictures of the life. It, they're not about death. They're not about the Holocaust. That's not what he was doing at the time. Now, obviously, history has created a very different meaning to this. So all this is to say photographers who go back and re-photograph places he photographed as, as manifestations of absence it's complicated. Oh, just, just, just one, one last thing. If you want to look at things historically, and if you want to try and maybe extract, if you want a bit more of the, what could be a sort of pure image of it, did you, as you mentioned uh, at the beginning, that there were many, many letters. Did you examine those letters? Yes. Because those <laughs> one, one or two letters will 
maybe give you a version of the truth that may be a bit not, not very accurate, etc. But you, if you examine 200, you will get a line. We, yes. Um, you, you should maybe be able to attend your exam. We actually, I have, I've read all the letters, um, and we've translated them all, which is amazing, which is thanks to, we've had over 40 interns over the years, translating everything, all the Russian letters, I mean, it's mm. really quite amazing. Um, what you, uh, you know, but it's frustrating, because I'll find this letter, like he wrote right after he arrives in America, in Russian, and then I get someone to translate it, and it's like him complaining of his indigestion for three pages. You know? So you're like, I mean, I have this poor intern who spent all this as a graduate student who's labored over this. Um, funny enough, you know, his letters, his correspondence is, I would say, 70% of it about his scientific work and research. Because he really saw himself as a, so people have asked often, was he in touch with this or that famous photographer? And actually, he was very proud, he was very close to an entomologist at Yale and scientist at Woods Hole, and he wanted to be regarded as a biologist and a scientist. And in fact, his son-in-law has, has a Nobel Prize in chemistry, his son was a famous biologist. Um, he, was, he wanted to be appreciated by them and by others as a real scientist, which he never quite fully was. And the letters are all about that, mostly. And a lot of complaining about indigestion. <laughs> Could I change the subject from indigestion to say, of course, um, <laughs> there is lovely wine upstairs. Our event stewards will whisk you up if you can't find your way. But also, you're most welcome, of course, to ask more questions informally. But I think after this splendid evening, we'll thank you now and then continue informally.